Hello, my name is Julia Sherwood and I will read an excerpt from a short novel by Jan Johannides, uh, one of the most acclaimed Slovak writers of the late 20th and early uh, 21st century. The book was published in 1995 as Trestajúci zločin. This is it. And uh, it's coming out on the 10th of June, translated uh, into English by my, me and my husband, Peter, under the title, But Crime Does Punish. This is what the cover will look like. And we are really honored that uh, this publication will inaugurate uh, a new series, Modern Slovak Classics uh, from Karolinum Press in Prague. And uh, I would like, to, before before we before I start, I would like to dedicate this reading to my former teacher, uh, Peter's uh, former colleague and our great friend, uh, Robert Pinsent, uh, Emeritus Professor of uh, Czech and Slovak Literature, who has written an afterword to this English edition and who has subjected our translation to uh, his typically unstinting, uh, rigorous critique, uh, gratefully received. And although he's unlikely to see this uh, reading, uh, because as everyone who knows Robert will know, uh, he doesn't believe in the internet. So to set the scene, in uh, this excerpt, uh, the narrator is a young man who has been recently released uh, from the harshest uh, prison in uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Valdice, uh, housed in a uh, 17th century Carthusian monastery. Uh, and um, he had been imprisoned on trumped up political charges. Now he's been released. Uh, he's working in a quarry, in a grueling job, and is renting a room in a house uh, somewhere in the Slovak countryside. The couple who owned the house were smart business types, uh, but they were unusually considered landlords nonetheless, very amenable. They even rented out rooms in their cellar. Every wall was whitewashed, a stove in every room, an affable, obliging attitude, a phone line, cookers, metal bunk beds, discretion. Had a female visitor, or not for that matter? No one would recall anything. They both worked for the secret police. To cut a long story short, one day, whether it was spring or autumn, I forget, I went up to the attic to hang up some vests and underpants to dry. There are always mountains of underwear up there, but this time, out of the blue, I spotted a pair of men's legs, a pair of large men's shoes, size 44 at least, socks and trousers of an indeterminate colour, swimming in the air, both of them. A pair of shiny black shoes, the kind once known as brothel creepers that are no longer in fashion, with rounded toe cups and thick soles. And although I could clearly see the shoes, the ankles in the socks, and the slightly too short trousers above them, my unconscious automatic reaction, without the slightest hesitation, was to refuse to believe that a pair of legs ending in black shoes could possibly be dangling there, just a couple of metres in front of me. I refuse to believe my own eyes. That's something you learn inside. I looked away. The reflex that my head had cultivated for years was still in perfect working order. It immediately convinced me that what I was seeing was just some suspended bits of fabric, that it was only the wind blowing above the asbestos cement roof in the dusk, the angle of light in the attic, and my own exhaustion, the exhaustion of someone who had been on his feet since 2.30 in the morning, combined with the permanent state of depression that spawns nightmares, all these conspired to create the impression that I was seeing a pair of shoes dangling in the air. You see, in order to survive prison, solitary, 
the catacombs of uh, Valditsa, believe me, you have to teach yourself to deny what's right in front of your nose. I had to teach myself, a training I underwent against my will, to deceive every one of my own senses. But at the same time, I had to become aware that my real eyes needed to beget a pair of fake eyes, because without this pair of fake eyes, the real ones wouldn't have survived. You needed elastic lies wherever you were, including in your own company, of course. In those days, I forced myself to believe something that was a sheer impossibility, for without believing in what was impossible, I would have had no choice but to use every last bit of my strength to bang my head regularly and deliberately, like a pile driver ramming piers into a riverbed to build a temporary bridge against those century-old, utterly innocent walls. Except that, once I had trained myself to revel in mirages, to hope that this, that or the other might be possible after all, I couldn't kick the habit. I wasn't able to rid myself of this scar, this physical defect that had corroded my soul. I had taught myself to see only what I wanted to see, and this shadow, which I had myself created under the pressure of Valdice, had become a faithful, constant companion of my real shadow. Just try to think this through, and imagine what it means to see only what you want to see. Can you understand that? In a way, this was a kind of training to prepare me for what I would see once I was out of prison. You see, the camera of the human eye needs to be trained, and then retrained, and then retrained again, in accordance with the latest party line. Do you follow me, Mr. Clementini? Thank you.